All right, well, good morning. I'm Will, in case you don't know me. Uh, I do college ministry here, and I'm super excited to be in front of you guys this morning. Honestly, I probably should have said no to today, not because the, the conversation is hard or, or I, I honestly am having a crazy busy day. So um, first, before I jump into my crazy day, I want to just acknowledge Happy Mother's Day to all the moms here. Um, super, super glad that we can honor you today. And we're having a conversation about honoring you today. Uh, but my day is a little wild. So uh, contrary to popular belief, I am old enough to have children. So just because I hang out with the college students doesn't mean I'm one of them. I'm 34, I got four kids. And if you've ever been in my boat with little kids, you know that Mother's Day is very contingent on how well you execute, right? So like, I'm very involved in Mother's Day um, for my wife. Uh, she's, she is a mom in my life, even though she's not my mom. She's a mom in my life that I wanna honor today. And, uh, and I have to make sure that that's going on. But I've been here preaching all morning. I left before my kids were even awake. And so uh, I had to like delegate a lot of stuff onto them. Of like, hey, I hope you guys can figure this out without me and uh, get breakfast going. You guys dress yourselves, please, so that she can have a peaceful morning. Um, so that was, uh, that's a bit about my morning. But um, I also have two moms here in town. Uh, so this might be a little mind-blowing for some of you if, uh, if you've not made this connection thus far. My actual mom lives in town, and her name is Sunny, and she is a short little Korean lady. And if you've ever been to the Chevron out in Welburn, that is my mom. Um, or maybe you've, like, encountered her throughout her career as a GM to lots of different restaurants here in town. If you know a Korean lady named Sunny, that's my mom. Some of you may not have connected that yet. So she is in town, and I need to honor her today, right? Um, I also have a mother-in-law in town. Um, her name is April Eington. So if you have ever needed tax work done or a CPA, if you've encountered Brewer, Eington, and Patoot and company, that is, uh, she's the Eington, right? So that is my mother-in-law, April Eington. All three of those moms are in town, right? So um, I have stuff I've got to do today, and I also am uh, responsible for honoring three different moms today. Um, it's a busy day. Um, oh, on top of that, I also am doing college ministry, and we have study hours from 7 to midnight tonight. That's my responsibility, so I got to set up for all that. So all that stuff crammed into today is making for a pretty wild day today, um, on top of it also being my anniversary. <laughs> right? Like you thought I was done with the list. I've been married for 12 years today. Like, that's exciting. And so, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's exciting, but it's like, that's just another added, why am I preaching right now? Like, I don't know why I'm here. But I'm so, so excited. Hopefully, God will speak something to you through, um, through all this. But let's be honest. Some of you might be in the same boat as me and feeling like Mother's Day is a day that you're trying to just survive. Like, I got all this stuff that I got to try and make sure my mom feels honored or loved on this day. And I have a lot of things that I need to do to make that happen. And I just need to make it through the day. And hopefully she feels honored. Right? Or some, some of you, maybe this day is hard for you. Maybe, maybe your mom is not here anymore. And that's a, a challenge for you in, in even just facing the day. Or maybe you're distant from your mom and like, the, the relationship that you have with your mom is, is a little plutonic right now, or there's like some tension between you and your mom, and, and that's hard for you. Or maybe, maybe you don't know your actual mom, and, and Mother's Day kind of brings a lot of that stuff up, right? So I'm not just talking about mothers for the sake of us reflecting on either shame in your life or shame on your mom or whatever. There are lots of mothers in our lives that are not biological, and that's great. That's blessing for us. And so what we're talking about today is I want to make sure that we're focused on that being blessing and not shame, right? In our society today, we pick up on a lot of that stuff of, of Mother's Day being a fluff, and maybe it's just like a covering of a lot of things that our moms do, but today's the day that we're just saying you're awesome, when really we might not think that, or we don't have the words to actually communicate how our moms are awesome. Or maybe our moms are awesome, and we're like, hey, this is easy for me to celebrate. There's lots of dynamics here at play. 
including the fact that I'm standing here before you as a congregation coming to worship God, and we're talking about Mother's Day as if that's a part of the church structure. Is Mother's Day actually something that we're supposed to be doing as believers? And part of me in my flesh, I was like, maybe if I tell them that they shouldn't be taking their moms out for meals would give me like a free pass to a restaurant so I can actually take my wife or my mom out to a meal, right? I'm not going there, right? I'm not putting shame on you and saying like, you shouldn't be doing the things that you're already doing for Mother's Day. It's good to recognize your mom, to give them a gift, to maybe have some sort of event or celebration around that, write them a card, tell them that you love them. It's fine. But in my process for this morning, I'm really considering how does Mother's Day intersect with us as believers? How are we as believers fulfilling our purpose in Christ through Mother's Day? Or is this just something that I shouldn't be talking about on a Sunday morning? Should we talk about something else? Am I over-glorifying moms today? Should I not be talking about moms at all? There's all these challenges with choosing what to teach on in light that today's Mother's Day, because I don't want to like gloss over the fact that we should appreciate moms. But what does this have to do with our Christianity? What does this have to do with following Jesus? So I want to back up a little bit. Historically, Mother's Day began in 1907. There was a lady named Anna Jarvis. I think I got that right. Anna Jarvis. And she actually started this day because her mom had passed away. And she wanted to honor her mother by declaring the day for her mother. That's why it's Mother Apostrophe S Day for all you grammar nerds out there. It's not Mother's Apostrophe Day. It's not plural mothers. It was her mother's day, right? She was dedicating the day to her mother. And it was such a profound motion that she did publicly that all these people saw what she was doing and they loved it. They're like, I want to honor my mother too. And so that's what created Mother's Day. And then like seven years later, Woodrow Wilson was like, there's all these states that are practicing Mother's Day. Let's just make it a national holiday. So it became a national holiday, Mother's Day. And of course, what we do as Americans around holidays is we commercialize the things. So we start to sell all these things and cards and gifts and tell them you need to take them out to meals and all that stuff, right? We, we create this event around a holiday that kind of loses the purpose of why we were doing it in the first place. It's funny, Anna, Jar Anna Jarvis actually, in, in her last years of living, was fighting against Mother's Day because it had become something that it was never intended to be. It became this expectation, this production, this gift-giving that felt a little removed from honor. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So I think that as a culture, we've actually become a people who have removed ourselves from understanding honor. And it is very deeply ingrained into what we believe as Christians. Like an example of, of what I'm talking about with Mother's Day and how we've become removed from this. I'm not harping on these flowers. Moms, please take a flower on your way out. They're going to die if you just leave them here. So please just take a flower. They are for you. That's why we got them. The origin of the flower within Mother's Day, Anna Jarvis, when she created it, she wore a white flower to honor her mom who had, who had died. She wore it. And on Mother's Day, if your mom was still alive and you wanted to honor your mother, you would wear a red or pink flower. It was for everybody honoring their mother to wear it, almost like uh, for breast cancer awareness, you wear pink and you have like the little loopy thing, like you see that all the time to honor that. You're not giving somebody that Thing, you're wearing it to, to honor it, right? It's the same thing. Those flowers were intended for all those who have mothers who want to honor to wear that as a badge of today I'm honoring my mother, right? But we've commercialized it in thinking, well, the flowers should be for our moms. So we buy flowers for our moms. And it's good to buy flowers for your moms. That's fine. But that's not its original purpose. It was for honor. So there's a whole lot that I want us to talk about in regards to this, of just understanding more deeply, is this something we need to be doing as Christians? 
Is this really what following Jesus is about? Or is this just something that's a part of our society that, they, that we walk through in routine? So as I've been processing even the history of Mother's Day, I wanted to talk about something that just resonated within me um, that's been a practice in my family. So my, uh, my wife and I, we've been practicing a regular Sabbath for a couple years now, uh, which is a 24-hour period of time uh, in which uh, we start on Friday evening and we have a day of rest um, all through Saturday. And uh, it's been a blessing for us. It's been a really, really big blessing for us. And within that practice, the reason why we're stepping into it isn't because we want to be lazy. It's not because we just want to do whatever we want to do. There's something that was convicting about the way that we were living our lives that was, that was convicting when we're reading the Ten Commandments. We see right next to don't murder, we see honor the Sabbath. In fact, God actually speaks the most. If you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus, the largest portion of the Ten Commandments is dedicated to honoring the Sabbath. Keep it holy. He's saying all these things around the Sabbath, right? It was convicting for me. Like, am I living my life not doing what God had created me to do? And it's not out of shame in saying, like, if I don't do it, I've sinned, more so than recognizing that the Sabbath was created for blessing, Right? I was made to walk this earth to take a day of rest. You know what else is there in the Ten Commandments? Honor your mother. It's a commandment. Honor your father and mother. It's something there. It's profound to know that we're not supposed to commit adultery side by side with honoring our father and our mother? God is saying that's how we were made to live on this earth. So Mother's Day very much so is, is not just something that we're supposed to be doing as believers. This should be regular practice in our daily lives of being a people with a culture of honor, knowing how to honor everyone. First Peter chapter 2 says we should honor everyone. Right? This should be so ingrained in our culture that we should understand how to do Mother's Day like that. Like we shouldn't have to wrap our mind, just like I've been doing. I'm like, man, I hope what I'm going to do. I hope the gifts that I've gotten, I hope the, the meal that I'm going to try and provide, all of that is going to honor the mothers in my life well. I hope. I'm just grasping at things, but there's pattern that God has created. The reason why I was talking about Sabbath is because entering into the Sabbath, you have a meal, and we've been practicing this, right? And the Jews would walk through, they'd like light the Sabbath candles, and they would bless one another, right? They'd sing some songs. In the blessing that Jews have been practicing every week for thousands of years, they bless their mothers. It's wild. You know what the blessing is? The blessing is Proverbs 31. So we're going to talk about Proverbs 31 this morning. But I just want to note that typically when people will teach on Proverbs 31 or when we look at Proverbs 31, we do like what most moms will do is we hold it up and we make comparison. We read through that, and we say, well, is mom uh, up to this standard? Is she doing all the things that are in this thing? And then I will withhold blessing my mom or praising my mom if she's not actually fulfilling all of these things, let alone the content. Gosh, we're going to walk through the content. It's a little goofy because it's like written thousands of years ago. So I want us to look at the lens, though, not through comparison. We're not here to put shame on our moms. We're not here to put shame on all of us that we haven't blessed our moms in this way. I want us to consider that this was intended for us to speak the truth over the moms in our homes. That's the purpose, to recognize how God has made them and to praise them for it. 
Okay, so let's walk through Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. If you want to open a Bible to that, we're spending our whole time in this. Um, it's also going to be on the screen as I read it right now. We're just going to read through the whole thing, and then I'm going to um, line by line kind of go through some of this. So, Proverbs 10. An excellent wife, who can find? She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the staff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Again, we could be talking a lot about this passage. There's so much we can unpack with the truths that are written in this scripture. But what I want us to consider is that Jews for thousands of years have read these words in blessing the wives and mothers of their household, right? So what can we glean from that? What can we glean from that? I mean, I know that I did not grow up in a household where that was regular practice to bless the mom, to consider the mom, right? We even have built in with our society that that's only one day of the year, maybe on their birthday or Christmas, to actually say something kind to our moms. This was a weekly practice, right? Again, no shame. No shame here. So I just want to line by line walk through this because really I wanna, what I want to do is I want to reflect on the truth of how God has made moms. And this doesn't mean biological moms. It can. But as I've seen in my own life, there are lots and lots and lots of mothers in my life that God uses to speak these exact truths into, into my life. And that's what moms do. That's how God designed them and made them. Okay, so let's walk through. Verse 10, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. Another translation says, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far beyond rubies. Right? Often, within this context, it brings us to a place of thinking that this verse is around valuing, a valuation of our, of our moms. But it's actually talking about how our moms have significant value beyond anything we can have on this earth. Significant value. If you really think about what a mom is to humanity, God has chosen a mother to bring life to everyone. The joke that Tommy's making the joke about how anyone who's ever had a mom, raise your hand. It's like, the truth. We all find life through a mom. It's crazy. And because of that, moms are valuable. They're valuable. We got to have moms. If we don't have moms in our society, we will cease to exist. Crazy. Valuable. Let's keep reading because we got a lot to cover. Verses 11 through 12, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. This kind of looks like we're flip-flopping into looking at the husband 
It's like, come on, can we not just have one passage where we're just talking about the mom, right? But no, we have to interject some sort, of, some sort of male perspective into there or something. I don't think that it's actually talking about the husband here. Even though the husband is interjected, what we're actually seeing is that the husband's heart trusts in her. Meaning, the mom can be trusted. Moms are trustworthy. There's a reason why a stereotype exists. That if you move on in life, you, you go off to college or into the work, workforce, you should be calling your mom. Why? It's not because your mom is like needing a call every, I mean, maybe your mom does need a call very often, right? But really, there's something there about trusting in your mom. Trusting in a mom. That moms find themselves trustworthy. There's something about the safety in being able to speak to a mom that you find comfort in. That's really great. Moms are trustworthy. Okay, let's keep moving. Verses 13 through 19. This is like my favorite one to walk through as I'm teaching because it's, it's out there, right? Verses 13 through 19. She seeks wool and flask and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. I just want to pause, right? Because <laughs> how many of you moms or how many of you have had moms that seek out wool and flax? Like, seriously, are you going after that stuff? Some of you are like, yeah, my mom, she seeks food from afar. She really just gets all of the foreign imports for our household. Like, that's, that's what she gets. Like, no, nobody. Moms sometimes are like, man, I hate to have to just drive two minutes to get to the grocery store even. Like, there's something in there that feels like it's so distant from our culture today. Of like, how many moms are really going that far to get food for her household? or seeking after wool and flax. It's weird. Okay, I want to keep reading, though, because I don't think we need to take it as literally as this may seem, right? It's more poetic than that. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable, her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. I want to talk about this very carefully, because I think that our culture would read something like that and potentially just set it aside because it doesn't make any sense or because maybe that's the old patterns of how a mom may operate within a household. So we just say, well, my mom doesn't sew, so how does that ever apply to her? Right, or I've never gone and um, considered a field to buy it, and from the fruit of my hand, I plant a vineyard. My mom doesn't garden even. Like, there's so much stuff there that's, like, how is that applicable to our everyday understanding of what a mom is? And I just want to be real with you. The reality is moms provide stability in the household. It's true. You can look at my life as an example. There are weekends where Aubrey has to go away and dad is in charge. And I'm like, I don't know how this is supposed to function. Like, I'm just trying to feed them whatever they can eat because I've tried cooking something and then they don't eat it. And then, like, they're like, I don't want to eat this. And I'm like, that's what she's always talking about. I don't understand. Like, it's, it's chaos in my household. It's chaos. I'm just trying to survive the weekends until she can come back, right? And then I'm like, I hope I've cleaned the house well enough so that you're not like stressed out and trying to bring all this back into order. It's not because God has made my wife a better homemaker than me. There's something there about the stability that she brings to our home. I am not stable when she's there. I mean, when she's not there. Like, I'm not stable. I can't, I can't make the decisions that I need to make. I can't figure things out. I can't keep things in a specific order because I need her. And that's good. It's okay. We see that when we move off beyond high school into college years, into young adult years. You see the same thing of, of kids that are living without the order of their moms. And they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I've got some really disgusting stories of like piles of clothes and 
a milk bottle for, like for my freshman year of college, right? So there's like all this stuff that there's something about a mom that brings stability into your life that's really, really good. And that's how God has made a mom, right? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 20. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. There's something here that has this component of thinking, well, does that mean that my mom needs to be the driver of where we are making charitable contributions? Or when we see somebody in need, whether we're, we're being compassionate towards that person and extending ourselves. I think that the, the thing that I've resonated with in, in processing the moms in my life and seeing this verse is not just about the extremes of need, but about how moms regularly will over and over sacrifice for the people that are around them. It's beautiful. I see it all the time. Yesterday, I'm at my house. Both me and my wife are there. And over and over and over again, it's not that I'm not doing anything. Over and over and over again, I see her where she has put herself in a place of responsibility where she, she says, I'm going to have to take care of this thing even though I don't want to do it because I know it needs to be done and it's going to be better for our household. Right? I'm going to clean this thing up for the third time even though I'm so frustrated I have to clean it up again. Right? There's something there about her willingness to give to those who are around her. Moms think about others often to their own detriment. It's just some, some way that God has made moms. That line is moms think about others. I don't think it's popped up yet. Moms think about others. All right, verse, tw- there it is. Okay, verse 21. Here we go. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Man, this is a great one for us. Because we don't have to worry about it. We live in the South, right? It's like, we don't have to worry about snow. Moms here are not worried about snow. That's why you live in Texas. You're not worried about it. Or maybe, maybe you really are worried about snow because you don't know what to do when it snows. And so you're like, I'm going to live in Texas to avoid the snow, right? It's not what it's literally talking about. Moms aren't worried about snow, and they clothe their children in scarlet. It's like this interesting combo of what's going on here. But what I want to say in this statement is that moms do not worry. They don't worry. Why? Why would I make that statement out of this? That they don't fear the snow and they clothe their kids in scarlet. Clothing your children in scarlet is actually a precursor to speaking the blood of Jesus over your children, right? There's something about moms that they're not worried because they know how to move forward in that preparedness, preparing their kids for Jesus, which is great, right? That's, that's how they don't worry. As believers, that's how we're walking forward in that truth, that a mom who will speak the blood of Jesus over their children has nothing to worry, right? Okay, Verse 20, uh, 22. I'm getting lost. Verse 22. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine limit, linen and purple. Something weird here, because I'm like, my wife, I don't think, like, she's got a sewing machine. She, like, begged me for a sewing machine, like, a couple years into our marriage. She's like, can I please get a sewing machine? I'm like, are you going to start sewing? Okay. We got it. I think she used it like three times. It just sits at our house. Not speaking against my wife. She tried, and she's like, this is really confusing, right? She would not have a clue in knowing how to make a bed covering. What the heck does that mean? Why would there be a verse about bed coverings? It doesn't make sense. And then on top of that, clothing is fine linen and purple, right? But there's something still about the way that I've seen moms operate, stereotypically again, that they care about details. Moms care about details in a good way. An example, the bed covering. If it were up to me, when my kids are going to bed, I'd be like, blanket, check. You're good, go to sleep. Put your head down, go to sleep. My wife's like, no, they need to have like their, their pillows, their blanket, both sheets. They need to have like their special blanket 
And so, you know, it's like there's, there's something there that's like, I don't think that way naturally. I don't naturally care for these types of details, right? And there's something else with this scripture. I'm telling you, there's so much to unpack here that we don't have time for. Of the clothing being fine linen and purple, that really that care, that care of detail is actually in light of royalty. Clothing of fine linen and purple is indicative of clothing the household as if you were royalty, right? And that's the care of detail that a mom has. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Again, interjecting the husband in here. How does this have to do with anything? But what I've seen with moms in my life, moms are surrounded by people who have elevated status because they have done something, they have sacrificed in a way that raises the credibility of those who are around them. They sacrifice in such a way. How many of us have lived our lives better because we've had a mom interject into something or to teach us something or show us how to live, right? Moms actually are raising, they're bringing credibility to those who are around them, including their husbands. All right, we're getting through this. Verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Now, I'm just going to give you some disclosure on my wife. I don't think she's ever, ever made a linen garment to sell to a merchant. But that woman can sell on Facebook Marketplace like nobody's business, right? There's stuff that I'm like, she's posting. She's like, hey, can you deliver this to somebody's house? They're going to give you $50. I was like, I didn't even know we had this thing still. This is great. You're making money off of stuff that we don't use. And she's finding bargains. She's like this crazy bargain shopper. Like, I could not... I could not figure that out. I'm savvy. I have a business degree. I could figure out sales and all that. I just, I just don't have that level of care, right? There's something about a mom that is resourceful. There's so many times in my life, so many times in my life, I've gone to the pantry. I've opened it up. I'm like, nothing to eat. There's nothing to eat in here. I go to the, the refrigerator. I open it up. I'm like, man, I'm starving. And then she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to whip up some dinner. It's like, with what? It's all empty in here. And she's just like pulling all this stuff out and just whipping something up. I'm like, you woman are resourceful. This is incredible. I don't understand how that works, right? And it's not just because men are stupid and dumb. And I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying to like deprecate on men today, right? And saying like, we can't take care of anything. In my own life, I've seen that my wife is crazy resourceful. She doesn't have to make linens and sell them. She is very resourceful in lots of other ways. Moms are resourceful. Okay, verses 25 through 27. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. There's so much in here, so much in here that's important that I think that often this verse is taken out of context and used to, um, to bring shame, to bring shame into comparison, to think I'm not measuring up to this. But what I see here in moms is that moms have character, strength, joy, wisdom, kindness, and they're hardworking, right? There's something about a mom that can navigate a lot of that stuff all in one, right? That they can be hardworking with joy at the same time. They can speak wisdom with a strength that's also kind in delivery. And that's how God made moms. It's beautiful, Right, so we're at this point where we're nearing the end of Proverbs 31, and you're like, man, Will, I am not tracking. My mom is not that. She's just not that. The mothers that I know are not that list. Like, yeah, maybe what I'm speaking is some sort of weird ideal that doesn't actually exist. And I don't want to leave us with thinking like, either our moms will never be this, 
or our moms need to become this. That really what I'm seeing here as I look through this list of things is I see why we have moms created by God. That if moms are living in their created purpose for all of humanity, it will look like this. And it is for their good and for our good. Right? The design that God made moms is for this. The response, then, we perceive in the end here. Verses 28 through 31. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. The danger of this ending, when we don't consider Proverbs 31 through blessing, is we use that as what we think is the achievement of becoming all those other things. That only if mom is all those things, her children will call her blessed. Her husband will praise her in the gates. They'll say, many women have done excellently, but you surpassed them all. Until then, they're waiting to say that. But that's not the heart of blessing. That's not what we're doing here. That's not what the Jews have done for week, uh, every week for thousands of years. They're not saying, this is the standard and you need to live up to it. And until then, I'm going to withhold speaking these words. The heart of blessing we see in a couple different ways. The culture of honor is found when we look at Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. She was not living according to God's people, except there was one caveat. She was found righteous because she actually was looking for someone in need and protected those people by covering them with flax. Wild, so wild. And from that moment on, moment on, she actually lived a really, really holy life following God. But the only two things she could claim to Proverbs 31 up until that moment of her life were those things that she sought after flax and that she extended herself to those in need. And you know what? Rahab is worthy to be praised. The cool thing that I see about Jesus walking on the earth and the ways that he interacted with people is he didn't look at all the things that they weren't. He tried to find the gold within somebody and he spoke that truth to them to bless them and it changed their lives. We see this all over the place in how Jesus interacted with people. We are to be a people that have a culture of honor where we look at what is good and we bless through that. All right, so what do we do today? Give some gifts to your moms. Get her some flowers. Get her a card. All those things are good. Take her to a meal, but not the place that I'm trying to go, right? Do all the things for your mom. It's good. But what I want us to take away is that God has created moms in our lives to display who he is and the glory of himself on this earth. So us recognizing and honoring our moms is praising God for who he is, that he has blessed us with life through the lens of our moms. And when we practice this, when we practice this culture of honor, what I want us to do today is just look at that list. Look at all the things there. And just ask God to highlight, God, how have you blessed me through whatever mom looks like to you? Just one of these things. How have you specifically in one of these categories displayed yourself to me through my mom? And the cool thing is, if we take that, 
that is a beautiful piece to honor your mother to say mom you did this for me specifically this is how I encountered God through you what a beautiful way to honor your mother to say mom you're so trustworthy there have been times where I felt like I couldn't trust anybody but I came to you and I can trust you and that's beautiful it's a display of God in my life That's a beautiful way to honor. Beautiful way to honor. Let's use scripture in that way. Not to bring shame, not to bring comparison, not to feel like we have to measure up. Let's use this as a tool to honor and to bless. So let me pray for us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for uh, for moms. God, even when, when this day might be hard for a lot of us, if, uh, if our moms are no longer with us, God, you still have a place where we can honor. You still have a place where we can recognize what you have done on this earth through our moms. So Lord, will, will you help us? Will you help us take a posture not of, not of this world of just doing a bunch of gimmicky things, but God, would you help us in blessing and honoring moms all across this earth. Thank you, Lord, that you display yourself to us through mother-like figures. God, you are good. We trust you. We obey your commandment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.